you develop a bioaccumulation problem. We are building up a toxic store of oxalate in our tissues. When you're eating them, you're eating both oxalate in a form of a crystal, because plants turn oxalic acid, which is this parent compound, into calcium oxalate crystals for the many purposes for their own use. So the circulatory system there is now picking up oxalate. That hepatic circulation delivers everything that you absorb from the digestive tract straight to the liver. And the liver is kind of this open tissue of sinusoids where the, all the cells are being completely flooded with the contents of the blood, which includes this oxalic acid. An ion or crystal of oxalate getting in the vicinity of a cell can cause the cell membrane to completely scramble its structure. You develop a bioaccumulation problem. We are building up a toxic store of oxalate in our tissues thyroid glands, bone marrow, tendons, all, all over. And when you quit eating them, the body's like, oh, geez, it's about time. We can finally clean house. Like your body's been waiting for this moment when you quit eating all these high oxide foods and it starts breaking down the deposits and you're refilling your bloodstream and your kidneys and your urine and your body with mobilized oxalic acid. So you re-intoxify, re-intoxifying yourself in the release process. I mean, your body's digging up toxic stores, like little waste barrels in your tissues and sending them out on the roadways, which is your arter arteries and veins and capillaries so that the kidneys can clear it out of your system. So this is like having like radioactive dump trucks with not covers on them, like spilling crap everywhere. Like it can be very unpleasant, the whole process of this what I call surgery without anesthetic of getting rid of this toxic load that's been building up ever since your first peanut butter sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's something that yeah, people don't really realize that, you know, the, these, these toxins do build up and say, well, you have it and it's just like your body clears it and gets rid of it, but, it, but it doesn't really, you know, a lot of these things do build, build up. So where, where do these things go? Is all your tissue or is there a certain tissue that they really go in and cause uh, more of a problem? Well, you know, you're, the, we're talking about the oxalates that come from your diet, which is the majority of oxalates that are in your body. Your liver actually makes some oxalate. It's the breakdown of vitamin C, excessive amounts of vitamin C become uh, oxalate in the body and certain amino acids can break down into oxalate in the liver. So when you're eating them, you're eating both oxalate in a form of a crystal because plants turn oxalic acid, which is this parent compound into calcium oxalate crystals for the many purposes for their own use. So you're eating crystals and you're eating oxal oxalic acid. And the oxalic acid starts going into your bloodstream from the stomach and the upper intestines. So the circulatory system there is now picking up oxalate. That hepatic circulation delivers everything that you absorb from the digestive tract straight to the liver. And the liver is kind of this open tissue of sinusoids where the, all the cells are being completely flooded with the contents of the blood, which includes this oxalic acid. And the liver cells are great at defending themselves from the toxic effects. They can produce a lot of glutathione and they spend a lot of energy. When your diet is high in oxalate, you just eaten a load of spinach, let's say, or a spinach smoothie or keto bread. Your liver is being flooded with this stuff that's really tough on the membranes and the mitochondria. And so this, they're busy, it's busy making and using up glutathione. And you're actually wearing out your liver's detox capacity. It's having to just protect itself from that meal. And then two inches up the inferior vena cava, you got the heart. That's the next place where the oxalates go, right? Because this is just the way blood flows out of your stomach, it, you know, from your stomach, it's moving to your liver, to your heart. Then it goes over to lungs to pick up oxygen and comes back to the heart and then goes into general circulation. So all that vascular tissue, the endothelial lining of the, of the vascular system is being exposed to oxalic acid in your heart, your liver, your heart, and your lungs critical organs to survival, right? <laughs> really critical. Like if your heart, any of them stop, you're big doo-doo. This is long before eventually the, um, the kidneys pick up oxalate and you pee out like 90% of it. So in the meantime, the body's got to like compensate for the fact that 
you can't leave this acid in your bloodstream because it's a chelator of calcium, magnesium, iron, you name it. But calcium and magnesium adore oxalic acid and vice versa. Those, those are matches made in heaven. And post meals, you can have dips in your magnesium and calcium levels in the blood. Well, there's this little bundle of cells in the heart called the pacemaker. They don't like that. <laughs> You're a neurologist, right? This is like nerves don't like their calcium metabolism disrupted. Oxalate's a great neurotoxin because it disrupts calcium handling in and around cells and other ions as well. Electrolytes and the management of electrolytes is critical to cell function. Inside a cell, we use calcium ions. They're called sparks, quirks, blurps, blot. They got all these names for the uh, endoplasmic reticulum stores calcium. In the mitochondria need calcium and do a little bit of calcium management and storage. They release little calcium ions to help the cell tell itself what to do. In the ions, these calcium molecules are sort of the messenger that comes over to a certain part of the membrane and say, hey, do this for me. Bring me some of this. Do this for me. This is how the cell's managing its function is with calcium ion communication. You add oxalic acid into a situation like that and you screw it all that up. You're basically kidnapping the, the messenger as he's trotting along from one kingdom to the next. You're just like wiping him out. It's like kidnapping is not good in cell electrolyte uh, management. So <clears throat> the pacemaker doesn't like it. The heart cells don't like it. No cell really likes their electrolytes being messed with, and that's what oxalate's doing. And so any cell, anywhere where we've got <clears throat> cells who are degenerating because they're just senile or because they've been injured by oxalate or something else, and this is the, the gross, you know, catch-22, you injure oxalate, so oxalate can now stick to these cells because... Um, Certain amino acids are very sticky to calcium and calcium oxalate go together. And so oxalate can stick to membranes that aren't healthy. So whenever you've got inflammation, infection, cellular stress, cellular death, or regenerating cells, those tissues are sticky to oxalate. So the oxalate that's forming crystals starts sticking to certain cells that or cell fragments. So you've got cells in different state of disrepair. You get a non-living cellular material that has zero ability to defend itself. A really robust, healthy cell can sort of rebuff oxalate crystals and oxalate ions and kind of manage it and survive it. But degenerating, inflamed, and fragmented tissue is just a sitting duck. And the, if the local cells can't really contain it, uh, you're going to attract immune activity and increase in inflammation. And then that inflammation creates more of that kind of inflammatory state that makes those tissues more prone to oxalate accumulation. So we see oxalate accumulation in cells with lots of turnover in anywhere we've got lots of wear and tear daily use because then you've got cells constantly being recovered and so on. And wherever you've had infection or injury, so if you had like frostbite, good chances where you have frostbite, you've got oxalate crystals there collecting. Okay. And then um, we talked about sort of, sort of off camera, but um, we were talking sort of about uh, the different ways that, that oxalates damage uh, your body and, and can probably precipitate cancers and things like that as well. Can you, can you go into a little bit about that, how it you know, damages membranes and, and precipitates, um, uh, you know, oncogenesis and things like that? Hey, everyone. Really happy to announce a new sponsor of the show for everyone in Australia, and that is Stockman Steaks, who deliver steaks and other meats direct to customer, delivering high-quality grass-fed and grass-finished, pasture-raised beef and other meats frozen to your door. They have high fat options for those of us on a keto carnivore diet, and you can even order grass fed and finished beef fat trimmings that you can fry up and add to your meal for the extra fat with high omega-3 fatty acids in it. If you're in Australia, unfortunately they're not shipping outside of Australia at the moment, but hopefully they'll be moving into other markets soon. So in Australia, you can use code CHAFEE for a free order of beef mints or another free gift as it may change from time to time. So just go down to stockmansteaks.com.au today and place your order now. Thanks guys. 
Yeah, it's the <clears throat> oncogenesis is seen in in uh, breast cancer and what's the other cancer? Suddenly I'm forgetting where they've actually documented both oxalic acid ions and uh, oxalate crystals generating regressive breast cancer and another cancer. But and the the thing is about this is if we looked at all the cancers and all the tissues, I think we'd find similar uh, outcomes. We just haven't done the work. Um, yeah. So an ion or crystal of oxalate getting in the vicinity of a cell can cause the cell membrane to completely scramble its structure. So there's certain kinds of molecules that are on the inner leaflet normally that flip, hmm. the ceramide flip, flips to the outer side of the membrane. And when they're facing the outside of the cell, the immune cells go, oh, damaged cell, let's take it away. And that process also increases free radicals in the cell. Of course, a mitochondria is a double membrane structure. And the same thing occurs with the mitochondria where you get severe damage to mitochondria, the cystae flatten out and the, the, um, the mitochondria start putting out more free radicals. And the more you get that oxidative stress, the more that breaks down more mitochondria, like there's this vicious cycle of infl- tissue damage creates inflammatory interest. In fact, they're called the danger associated or damps, danger associated molecular whatevers, where the cell is leaking stuff like potassium ions. Right? Potassium belongs inside a cell. Sodium is supposed to be on outside of the cell. When potassium is leaking from cells, that tells the immune system, oh, come get this problem. And so this is, you know, inflammasome turned on. It, actually, it's a great turnaroner of inflammasomes because it causes this leakiness. It causes increases in um, lactase dehydrogenase and other, you know, and free radicals. It causes the cells to put out more osteopotin, which is, you know, helps to lower crystallization and kidney stones. And the more you have kidney problems, the more, you know, there's like all these layers of metabolic effects that you're having as you're stressing these tissues that when left to be chronic, because, Hey, you're having potatoes, chocolate, nuts, and, you know, spinach and Swiss chard and sweet potatoes multiple times a day, not just every week or every day, but like we're chronically exposing ourselves to plant toxins, particularly oxalate, because it turns out the foods that are high in oxalate have gotten more and more popular and available here in the U S for the last 20 years, you cannot go out to a meal without being offered. Would you like chips or fries or bakes with that? You know, like you've got to have potatoes at every meal (laughs) and now spinach is everywhere because of course you get to have your chocolate. If you eat your spinach or that's how we raise our kids. You know, you, if you eat your vegetables, you can have this, dessert. And nowadays, chocolate, which is very high in bioavailable oxalate, every single ice cream flavor has got some form of of chocolate or nuts in it or both. And this is becoming true for treats in general, that chocolates and nuts are everywhere because they're both supposedly healthy. So you can feel good about your sugar, sugar and (laughs) addiction. So I'm like all over the map here, but basically cells in your tissues are under a fair amount of energetic oxidative stress that's not only disrupting electrolytes in cells, it's causing energy dysmetabolism where the cells are actually underpowered for energy. That's really a bad thing. And it's also causing a certain form of malnutrition and deficiency. You know, it's adding up to tissue damage and processes of disease that take a long time to really develop and manifest because the body is prioritizing your electrolytes in the in the blood and prioritizing healthy blood, doing its best to kind of manage things in the background. And in that management, it does require the body to pull oxalate out of the blood to protect the vital organs. And it does have to sequester and hold on to this after meals that are pretty significant in oxalate, it only takes like an ounce and a half of chocolate mm. to create a big surge in, in oxalate in the body. So it doesn't take giant amounts of these foods necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. And, and normally people that are eating chocolate aren't, aren't, aren't eating an ounce. You know, they're eating <laughs> like, you know, pounds of this stuff. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing with potato chips and French fries yeah. too. It's like you go to like, there's five guys here. They give you like a pound 
of French yeah. fries. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there nobody sprinkled B vitamins or done anything to compensate for the fact that there's no nutrition in its pure toxicity and it's considered a normal meal. Like it's acceptable to have French fries mm -hmm. every time you go out for lunch. Yeah. And, and, you know, to your point uh, about all, all this damage, you know, damaging the mitochondria, especially in flattening the Christ day, um, you know, that, that's something that, that uh, we were talking about before, but that, that Otto Warburg Nobel prize winner in, in um, medicine back in 1931, he did decades of work after that. Um, you know, he showed that, that cancer really, it, you know, it, it gets from damage to the Christ day and to the mitochondria. And in, in biology, you know, it, there's the, there's this idea of structure equals uh function you know and, and if you damage the the structure the function is going to be damaged as well you can't you can't go about that process and so when you flatten out that crist or, or destroy them entirely like you get in in a lot of cancers like a uh, glioblastoma um that i was specifically you know uh, lecturing on today that you know, you, you, you cannot work properly. You cannot go through oxidative, ox, oxidative uh, phosphorylation. And that is actually the, the hallmark of cancer. It's not the genetic changes. There are entire, there, there are multiple, you know, every, every cell in a tumor, they'll have different genetics. They'll have different uh, mutations or, or sometimes they may not have any mutations at all. There are entire cancers that don't have any mutations that we found. And I'm like, oh, that's very interesting. It was like, how can it be the, the DNA driving like uh, cancer if there are no mutations, if it's, if it's a normal cell, all of them have this hallmark of uh, fermentation. All of them have damaged mitochondria in some sort of uh, uh, form or number or both. And when they go through that alternate pathway of energy um, production, which is a substrate, um, phosphor, um, substrate phosphorylation of glutamine and uh, glucose, that creates a lot of free radicals, like you were saying. Those damage the DNA. Those cause uh, uh, you know um, different mutations, and again, compound the issue with the mitochondria. So you, you start, you know, you start pushing the rock down the hill, and uh, but then you know it, it just gets carried on and further on because you start with the oxalates. It starts damaging the mitochondria. Then that damage begets more damage and more free radicals. And uh, and also reg and also stimulates the 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 nucleus to actually pull in more glutamine and glucose to just throw fuel on the fire because they're like oh well we're not respirating properly and this is mm -hmm. why cancer cells pull in four hundred times the amount of glucose as as normal cells and so that's mm -hmm. that's very interesting I didn't know that about about oxalates damaging the mitochondria like that. change to the cell membranes makes the active proteins that reside in the membrane to do all the work not function properly because they literally the proteins and membranes 